Good, thank you. Thanks very much. Very nice to be here. This has been on the drawing board now for a very long time, and I think one of the reasons why um, it's difficult to bring to maturation or to bring to a conclusion would have to do with, uh, with a couple of things. One of them is that I am discovering that uh, no particular investigator is really commensurate with this topic, and that may be true about any topic. I mean, in other words, the, the, the topic always uh, exceeds a particular investigator's resources. And in this case, the way the project was initially conceived, which turned out not to be very practical as a way of proceeding, was that I was going to look at seven aspects of black cultural production in the contemporary period. And I was going to do it from the point of view of seven African diasporic cities. Uh, a city in Canada, which is Toronto, uh, a city in uh, the Caribbean, uh, which is Kingston, and then Detroit, Chicago, and New York City in the United States, London and Paris in Europe. And so each one of these sites was going to be, was going to represent an aspect. So that I was looking at uh, music, the culinary arts, uh, filmmaking, uh, religious expression, and three or four other things. And I decided that, um, well, it would, it would take the rest of my life and several, several other people to do a topic like that. And so then what I decided that I was going to do is talk about commemorative spaces in each one of those cities. And so that's what I'm doing now. Built space, commemorative spaces, and just about anything I'm learning can be a commemorative space. I mean, for instance, the Bob Marley Memorial in the city of Kingston is something called uh, the Culture Yard, which is a space that has been, that, an open space that has been uh, set aside for his memory. And so a number of places like Stax Records uh, in Memphis, uh, the old Motown recording studios in Detroit are all now commemorative spaces. So I'm very curious about what we could call with a great deal of justification the new museum. These are not customary uh, museum spaces and even certain customary museum spaces like uh, the Pompidou Center in, uh, in Paris or Whitechapel Gallery in London are in a number of cases devoted for a certain amount of time to African exhibits, to black arts. I mean, I saw, uh, for instance, Africa Remix at the Pompidou Center in Paris about uh, four years ago. And so it seems to me that that extends the definition of the traditional museum. And it gives us some extra thing to think about in relationship to what a museum space is. So that this project is actually going to be carried out in, uh, in two pieces. One of them is what is black culture today? And that's why I'm traveling to those cities uh, to look at built space, uh, commemorative spaces, to try to talk about cultural practices in African diasporic communities today. But the other side, but the other side of this problem, which I've tried to write about uh, a little bit, has to do with the theoretical part, and that is what is what is the idea of black culture? And I would, well, I have a few things to say. One of them is that the idea of culture from the point of view of uh, the postmodernists is in a state of crisis. It really doesn't get around much anymore. 
in, in certain circles. When I said to certain friends and colleagues of mine uh, a few years ago that I had been commissioned to do this project, uh, a friend of mine literally looked at me and said, oh Lord, sucked his teeth <laughs> and, <laughs> and went, oh, culture. I mean, that's just, so it's not in some circles. Uh, it, is, it is an idea uh, that is supremely problematic at best. So that's, that's a part of, uh, I think, the crisis that I feel as a scholar because one of the ideas of black culture is that black culture is in conversation or is in dialogue with a number of other spaces along the cultural repertoire, right? So that in effect, uh, black culture is just, is simply not talking to itself. It's talking to uh, a number of other cultural formations. So that, 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 that really is the question. What, what can we say about culture today in a postmodern frame, right? I mean, in a, in a temporal and spatial progression that is considered post everything imaginable. What can we, what can we say about the idea of culture? And if it's, if it's black culture, what does that mean in relationship to some general idea? Before I talk to you about a few notes which you are probably already familiar with if you read the essay, uh, the, uh, the idea of black culture, I'll just say what um, the propositions that I have taken on the subject. One of them is that black culture is critical culture. Black culture is critical culture. And if black culture is critical culture, what I am suggesting is that perhaps it hasn't really come about yet. Perhaps it's an event to come. As the, as the idea of critical culture matures. And so related to that idea is the notion that today, black culture is not limited to an ethnic group and ethnicity. It is a critical position taking across the race divide or across lines of race. And if that's true, then what that says is that anybody can take up the culture, can study it, can be a part of it. And I think the, the assertion of that idea hasn't been possible very long. I mean, it, it, that's not an assertion that I could have made in the context of my generation 30 years ago, and that's the generation of the 60s. That wouldn't have been possible to make. That would have been considered a treacherous and traitorous statement three decades ago. And so if what I am suggesting is, is correct, and anybody can belong to it, then that would certainly mean that uh, not all black people are part of black culture. If it's a critical posture. And so if, you, if you're not talking about it from the point of view of morphological race or some set of genetic traits, that, 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 that come to name a culture, and I don't think that's ever really what it was in the first place. I think it always had to do with the historical apprenticeship of African peoples in the context of the New World. And those discourses and epistemologies that uh, those communities worked out in relationship to slavery, colonization, and, and so forth. So far as I'm concerned, that has never been a matter of, 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 of biology. 
Though that's not the way it looks. It looks like that's exactly what it is. But when you, when you, when you think about it, and by that I mean when, you have, when you've been given the opportunity to gain some distance from it, then you begin to see uh, what the work of culture actually is. And the work of culture, I think, is very much related to the kind of work that Du Bois is attempting to do early on in the 20th century. So this course that um, I teach at, um, at Vanderbilt as a graduate seminar is an attempt to get a hold of that question going back to Du Bois because Du Bois is one of uh, the principal dogmatizers and theorizers of an idea about black culture. And it's stated quite succinctly in a couple of places in Souls of Black Folk. Early on in the opening chapter of uh, Du Bois's work, he talks about black culture as an oasis in a dusty desert of dollars and smartness. An oasis in a dusty desert of dollars and smartness. So Du Bois in 1903 and even before 1903, because these essays, as you know, make up a collection of essays that Du Bois published in 1903, but a number of those essays had appeared in other, in other venues, right? And so Du Bois understood quite early that the gospel of wealth and materialism that he thought had taken hold at that point of American culture in so forceful a way that the culture was drowning in it, was toxic for American society if there was no antidote to it or relief to it. And so his idea of black culture was that it was the one place at that point, and therefore his criticism of Booker T. Washington, who is overcome by the materialistic synthesis of what progress was early on in, uh, in, in, in the century. Du Bois thinks that it's poison. And there are several places where he points out the toxic effects of unbridled, the unbridled pursuit of wealth. And that is Atlanta, the city of Atlanta, and is comparing that to the myth of Atalanta at that, uh, at that moment. Du Bois at that time is um, a sociology professor at uh, what was then Atlanta University in, um, in Atlanta, Georgia. So D D Du Bois's understanding of, of culture as the alternative to the materialistic is an idea, I think, that gives him something in common with certain aspects of the Frankfurt School. So that that's really what I take up in the idea of black culture. It's really based on a comparison between aspects of Du Bois's theoretical posture in Souls of Black Folk and aspects of Herbert Marcuse's thinking about culture in uh, a couple of essays uh, that Marcuse wrote in uh, the 60s, right? So it seems to me that the mission or the work that Du Bois is assigning to black culture is the mission of critical culture, period, right? So that we call it black culture only because it is associated with ethnicities in particular places related to the African diaspora. But it is a much larger task or mission or calling than, than, that, than that particular task. 
And it's done its work very well because one of the things that uh, black culture has been called upon to do is to push forward the emancipatory project so that we have black culture in its expression as protest to thank for the achievement of a society that's a lot closer to uh, equality than it was the day that I was born. I have seen incredible uh, progress made in American society. I was born in a society that operated strictly according to racial code, to color code. Everything in Memphis, Tennessee in the period of uh, the Second World War was predicated on skin color. Where you lived, the church you went to, the schools you attended, the people who were your playmates, your teachers, your principals. So I grew up in, in an all-black world. Orange Mound in Memphis, Tennessee is still there today, but it's a very different neighborhood today uh, from the neighborhood uh, in which I grew up. The neighborhood in which I grew up was really something like an extended family, right? We knew everybody on just about every block for blocks. We not only knew them because they were in our class and because they had sisters and brothers who were in your sisters and brothers classes, we also knew fathers' names and where men worked and we knew who people's grandparents were and we knew all kinds of things about families. And it seemed to me that that was simply the way things worked in the world. I found out since that they don't, uh, they don't work that way at all. So that that neighborhood today is much closer to what uh, the rest of the world is and that is you don't know your neighbor or in some cases your neighbor is transient. Um, so it's a very different place uh, from the place that I lived in. So that when I entered the State University after having spent a year at uh, a private girls college in North Carolina, Bennett College in Greensboro, North Carolina, I entered the University of Memphis and that was my first systematic contact with uh, European Americans, with, uh, with white people, because there was no such contact as that in the society in which I grew up. Memphis is a very different place today. Memphis, Nashville, certain southern capitals, even though I think it is a region of dangerously mixed signals, right? I mean, there is on the one hand, um, a region with black representation, but on the other, red state politics, which I'm sure you've heard uh, a great deal about, and so forth. In any case, it's a different, it's a different social map. It's a different, it's a different uh, place today. And that different place was brought about uh, because of, not only because of black culture, but because of one's belief in it. It reaches its culmination with those movements that belong to uh, the 60s, the world between Brown versus Board that changed the public schools in the United States and the end of the war in Vietnam in 1973. So between 1954 and 1973, I think the work that black culture was cut out to do that really starts uh, with what we imagine protests to be uh, with, the, uh, with the African slave trade, that work reaches its, uh, its point of culmination uh, with, with, with the 60s movement. So the emancipatory project is one, is one of the tasks of black culture, but I think it has a much larger task than that, or a task uh, beyond those precincts. And I think its larger task is to complete the work of equality, to complete the work of sustainability, 
and to try to make the globe safe for human habitation once again. Those are our big problems. And they transcend race. They don't, they don't, they don't have to do with race because truly if we lose the planet, which all intelligence suggests that we are losing, truly if we, if we lose the planet, uh, I can't imagine what's next. You know, you can always imagine the next step I can't imagine what the next step is beyond that. So the work of, the work of regaining uh, the planet and getting it in the hands of forces that I would call capable of human response, which I would contrast with corporate or mechanistic response, That is what I would consider the work of the work of culture. And that's why I call it critical culture. And from that point, and from that point, from, from that angle, all the races are at work on that, on that task. And if black culture can therefore position itself or poise itself to be a leader in that struggle, I think it will have, I think it will have done its work when, when the fact of blackness as a social fact, in fact, disappears, right? I mean, it seems to me that that's, that that's, one, that's one place we could say it stops or it it fulfills its mission. I'm not sure that that, um, I'm not sure that that's where we're going. Du Bois was disappointed in the 1950s at um, what he thought black culture had become. And that is a replica of the culture around it. And as you know, Du Bois, because he was associated with certain peace groups in the 1950s, uh, lost his, or was ne his, his passport was never given back to him. So Du Bois couldn't travel outside the United States after the Bandung Conference and the conference that held some months later in 1956, the famous conference at the Sorbonne uh, that James Baldwin attended, that Richard Wright attended, and that James Baldwin has written about in a famous essay called Princess and Powers. That essay in James Baldwin's Price of the Ticket, which is his uh, collected essays, is James Baldwin's report for Encounter magazine of, uh, of that particular meeting. And all the names that we associate with uh, cultural theory in the, uh, in the contemporary period, or I should say the predecessors of our contemporaries and near contemporaries were all at that meeting uh, at the Sorbonne. And that, that would include uh, Richard Wright, Leopold Senghor, the late Leopold Senghor, um, the mayor of uh, Fort de France, uh, Martinique, what's his name? Uh, Césaire, Aimé Césaire, France Fanon. They were all at that, were all at that, uh, at that, particular, at that particular meeting. Du Bois wrote, sent a telegram uh, to that conference to say that um, I can't come because the United States uh, government has taken my passport. 
And so some thinkers believe that that, comprom that telegram compromised members of the U.S. delegation that included Horace Mann Bond, the father of Julian Bond, uh, and the former president of Lincoln University in Lincoln, Pennsylvania. Dr. Dr. Horace Mann Bond was a part of the U.S. delegation that was there with African delegations, uh, delegations from the Caribbean, and of course from uh, sites in Europe, notably uh, Paris. The proceedings uh, from uh, that conference um, can be found in a special issue of Présence Africaine. And Présence Africaine at that time is just about a decade old, having been created in 1948. So some members of the U.S. delegation thought that um, Du Bois compromised their presence there because what that telegram impl uh, implied was that the only way you can get out of the United States is to be complicit with its purposes, its foreign policies, its foreign and domestic policies. And since I can't travel, I'm obviously not compatible with those protocols, and therefore I have n I've been prevented from traveling. So Du Bois leaves the United States, dies abroad in Ghana, ironically on the eve of the March on Washington. The day before the March on Washington, Du Bois dies in Accra, Ghana. So he didn't live to hear Martin Luther King's very famous speech. He died about 95 years old. He called his last autobiography a soliloquy from the last decade of the first century of my life. A man born, uh, let's see, three years after Appomattox and the end, of, uh, the end of the Civil War. So from February 1868 over to April 1963, and you can do the math on that, right? I mean, he's well on his way to uh, a century old. So Du Bois dies in, in some disappointment that his country has gone in the direction that it's gone. And he did die with uh, communistic and socialist uh, sympathies that, of course, the State Department noticed. And then he felt that uh, perhaps black culture had not been true to the vision that he had of it many decades earlier when Souls of Black Folk uh, came out. I think what that means then, or what that sets us up to look at, is the extent to which black culture has become, quote, successful at its Americanization. It is the Americanization of the African, right? And that happens to every ethnic group that is a part of U.S. experience, goes through that. And the way we recognize that we are going through it is the fact that the President of the United States today is, is black. So I think that means that uh, black culture has, black culture has been successfully Americanized. Now we can get into what that means, but I think that's one thing, that's one thing it means, that the process of Americanization has been completed, at least in theory. I'm not sure it says anything about practice. 
but I believe it has been completed in theory. The response to the 2008 election of Barack Obama, for me, raised the question about black culture. I mean, that's one way that we can talk about uh, the question of black culture. We can raise it in that frame. Does the election of uh, an African-American or whatever, whatever name we want uh, to call uh, President Obama, mixed race, uh, some people are very upset that he does not check the white box on the census form. He checks the black box. <laughs> some people think, wow, what? He's not just a black person. He's a, he's a white person. But I think, I think President Obama is thinking about something else when he checks that black box. I don't think he's just thinking about genetics or morphological makeup. I think he's, I think he's thinking about, I think he's thinking about something else. So that the question um, that was raised in my mind, and for a very long time I was not able to write about this. And I wasn't able to write about it because I was at odds with my, nat my natal community about what that election meant. I think for some people, it was a kind of teleological fulfillment, right? It was the answering of destiny. It was the place to which black culture had been tending all the time. So that it was a point of, it was the point of destination. Whereas for me, it is a point of departure so that it's a point of takeoff, not a place to stop. And so I think one reading of the 2008 election and of course the 2012 re-election, some people thought that was more important than 2008, but what does happen with 2008 was that question that was raised in my mind. What does that mean? Is this the point at which we can no longer really talk about black culture because black culture as a self-consuming artifact has really disappeared in the fulfillment of a destiny, right? I mean, in the fulfillment of some design or some dream that comes about with the election of this man, right? I mean, is, this is the fulfillment of Martin Luther King's dream, some people thought. It's a question mark in my mind. So that is there life after Barack Obama? I think there, I think there may well be <laughs> in relationship to the question of color and in relationship to the question of critical culture. And therefore, I don't, I don't think the mission of... Uh, of black culture is complete. Although some people are very worried about critical culture in the United States from the point of view of the left because that election has strangely silenced the left. If you know what I mean. This president doesn't get asked about poverty for instance, or doesn't get asked why the black employment rate is twice the white employment rate. Now, why is that so? I think because people feel, oh, well, that's not, he's up against enough, right? So we can't really, he can't really talk about race. All presidents have talked about race. Why should this president be different? I mean, somehow the protocol has shifted a little bit in left circles. And that, that's what I mean when I talk about a crisis in our sense of what critical culture, critical culture can do. And then the last thing uh, that, I, that, I, that I'll say, and uh, I'll see if we, can, if we can open it up a bit. The last thing that, that proposition that I want to take on black culture is that um, 
black culture has become a curricular object. One of the prime locations of black culture today is the academy. Is the university in North America, Canada, the United States. I'm assuming, uh, or I would imagine Mexico, though I'm not certain about that. I know a little something about uh, the Canadian curriculum through my, uh, through my colleagues, and then quite a lot about the American one uh, as a person long employed in that system. And I think that's another reason why it has become uh, an object to contemplate, an object for philosophical investigation, theoretical investigation, And the reason why that interests me is that that's been a, a couple of decades coming. Because black studies and women's studies and all such studies like that really started as movements outside the walls of the university. As a matter of fact, the university was considered a hostile space to something like black studies. And one of the chapters in, in my biography is participating in a building takeover at Brandeis University in the late 60s as a graduate student. And one of the reasons why we were taking over the building is that we were creating, that was one of the 14 demands, that we were creating the Black Studies program at Brandeis University, which is one of the first Black Studies programs in, in the United States. So that black studies and women's studies all start as movements. The women's studies movement begins almost simultaneously with black studies. Of course, black studies and women's studies have always run in tandem, black movement and women's movement, going all the way back to the 19th century. When women really earned their political chops observing abolitionists, right? That's where that movement starts and then women apply those uh, strategies uh, to their to their to their to their own movement. So those movements really always start outside. So the moment of transition, to my mind, between movement that's starting outside the university and the curriculum inside the university is a very is a, is, is a very fascinating moment that I think rewards study. So that today. Uh, one of those important subjects in relationship to uh, a theoretical protocol is black culture, black studies. So that's essentially what, what the project is from the point of view of the theoretical portion of the work, arguing those different, those three or four different postures. And doing it, of course, in total fear. <laughs> because there are some people, I think, who are waiting on this book to jump on it. <laughs> to jump on me for daring raise the issue of culture in 2013, 2015. After the new millennium, somebody would dare speak about culture. After the predicament of culture and all the works we know about that's critical of, uh, of the notion of culture. There's, there's Deserteau's theory about culture and how it is the colonized aspect of a society that has been taken over by the young lions of finance and high capitalism, high capital, 
that's in that, that article, uh, the idea of culture. So that um, the weak sister or the weak link or the powerless link in the society from the Sartos point of view uh, is what uh, culture has become. So that in a sense, I am uh, resurrecting a topic about which Raymond Williams said some years after Keywords, when he was interviewed in New Keywords about the word culture, what he said was that damn word. You remember that? That he said that in that uh, in that in that text. So that in some ways this is an attempt at um, restoration in order to get a chance to look rather systematically at why it's a word that has fallen, or why it is a term that has fallen into such ill repute in our time. And I think one of the reasons why it has fallen into ill repute has to do with our temporal location. We are located in a post-Holocaust, right? In a post-genocidal frame. when culture in significant parts of the world collapses, right? I think that's, I think that's why, and why the term for uh, many, many intellectuals is today bankrupt. But what I will say, in, absolutely, in closing, is that uh, we need the word, we need the concept, because I believe Marcuse, I believe Du Bois in the sense that there is a work for culture. There is cultural work to be done. So we need the term, I think. We certainly need the place. And if we decide that we really can't define culture, that it must be a placeholder, I think we can find a number of concepts to place there that we need uh, to preserve uh, in relationship to, to our, our own life uh, on the planet. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks. I think we will, that is obviously, thank you so much for attending. Thank you. Uh, there were so many notions in here, and so many ideas. I think we will actually open the, these questions right for you to respond to, That's or just to start know. associating with little bits and pieces of them to begin to, to get into conversation. Eric, do you want to do the honors? Sure, I do want it. I have a bit of a point of clarification. When you talk about um, black culture as a critical posture, <laughs> and something that transcends an emancipation narrative and moves towards um, equality, sustainability, mm -hmm. a safe world for humans, mm -hmm. um, what is the, uh, I mean, do you advocate keeping the term black in there, or are you just using it because you want to explore what could be black culture today? So, I mean, what I mean is, like, if you're going to propagate uh, this kind of critical posture, you're going to require the support of, like, non-morphologically black persons as well, and um, is it necessary to colorize the term when you yourself said that it sort of transcends just the pure morphological aspect? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it alienate people that aren't morphologically black? and potentially be counterproductive to the cause? That's really a wonderful question. Um, and I've asked myself the question. That, that if, if you're saying black culture is all these things, why do you, at the end of the process, I mean, when you've gone through whatever it is that you're going to go through, why would, you, why would you come to the end of it and still call it black culture? And what about people who don't want to call it that? 
but who see the world in ways that you think are critically important. Why would you still call it that? And so I don't, I don't really have an answer to your question, except that to call it black, even after all of that, would be poetic irony, right? And so that's, that's the only reason why I would, that, that's the only reason why I would, I, would, I would call it that. A publisher thought that the idea of black culture needed explaining. Now, I, I think I have in my mind, have a pretty good idea what the publisher had in mind. That um, I'm expected to say something, I mean, from the publisher, publisher's point of view, there had better be black culture. Or I'm in trouble, or the publisher, I mean, somebody's in trouble, it's like, what do you mean? And so, if this putative object has to be materially there, from the, from the publisher's point of view, the question is not questionable. But from my point of view, it's a putative, it's a putative object, or it's a, it's a question that we raise about the question itself. And that's what I'm trying to turn the project into. But my sense is that that's not necessarily what will make the publisher happy. So I'm thinking that if, you, if, if, if the publisher has some places that you have visited, that would make the publisher happy because you're then reclaiming the concrete or the material or the, or the real, right? But from a theoretical point of view, um, the, kind of, the kind of questions that you raise are the kinds of questions that, that, that I'm trying to raise. What makes this black if anybody can, can participate? Which is what I'm advocating, right? So why is it still black? So it's really a good, it's a good question. Yeah. Yes, sir. <coughs> This, this interview is that black culture evolves from a, so from the beginning of a slave narrative, as it were. And in, so how would that be affected, say, in the case of the, in the case of most specifically Montserrat, where you have two slave cultures side by side evolving, uh, a joined culture. So how, how would the, the the beginning of the slave narrative affecting? Um, the black culture then sort of change if you have two sets of slave cultures evolving at the same time. Okay, did you say a particular place? Uh, Montserrat. Montserrat. Yeah, could you explain that situation to me? Um, Montserrat was predominantly a uh, place with uh, both Irish slaves and African slaves. Okay. Yeah. You know, I'm not sure that it would be, I'm not sure that it would be different. Though the situation of Montserrat uh, is, not, uh, is not one I know. Have you studied the Montserrat uh, Only in sort of society? small portions. Um, it's because it, just, it seems to be a characteristically different culture than even, say, the rest of the Caribbean yeah. islands. Because even, well, admittedly, they all have their own individual culture, but we're going to find that we're around anyway. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, but in and of itself has a very distinct, different way of narrative, if you want to put it that way, um, okay. than a lot of other more natural slave narratives, which seems to be the case in, say, the States or other Caribbean islands, mm -hmm. or, or even in England, you say, um, mm -hmm. where it seems to be, where it's generally African slaves, and their narrative in various settings. Mm -hmm. Montserrat different set because there's two sets of slaves. You see what I'm getting at? I do see what you're getting at. Yeah. Um, let me talk a little bit about, uh, about this situation that might be analogous, but analogous only a little bit. And it goes something like this. The first, and this is going to sound like it's very far away from, from what you're talking about, but maybe it might, it might help us talk about that situation a little bit. 
The first blacks in what becomes the United States arrive in Virginia in 1619. It's not clear what their status is, but it's almost certain, according to some historians, that they are not slaves, right? So that the situation of slavery evolves over that, over that century. So that uh, eventually black skin or, or African looks, Africanity and slavery become synonymous. One other thing that's interesting about Virginia is that it has 10 classes of indentures. So that everybody is in some kind of indentured class. So that it is, as far as I can tell, the most hierarchical colonial society in, in, in North America, and certainly that part of North America that becomes the United States. One historian, and I think his name is Ivan Allen, argues that European workers and African workers did not start out as enemies. That racism was induced by slaveholders and the planter class, that there was no automatic hostility between Europeans and Africans. Because we tend to think that Europeans and, and Africans are automatically and always hostile to one another. But what this historian points out is that, that that's not true. That there were moments of solidarity between those workers and the platter comes along and intrudes racist motives, right? So that racism as, as a poison and as something that is akin to magic, as the Field Sisters talk about in a new book called Racecraft, where they talk about racism as magic, right? That comes along and it is, it is so powerful um, a blinding element that it makes a person misunderstand what his or her interest really is. And that his interest or her interest has nothing to do with that other person because they share a skin color, right? And that's what, that's what racism has always been able to do. That those elements that have always had something in common economically, have always been interrupted by racist poison, right? And so that's, that's still a difficulty in, in, in the southern United States. And all those old Confederacy states associate the Democratic Party with black skin, black rights, and from their point of view, it's a zero-sum game. If black people are gaining, white people are losing. If white people are losing, black people are winning, or however that would, however that would go, right? So I would, I'm suggesting that uh, if you're in a society where you have exploitation across the race lines, I would be surprised if there is not some element of solidarity between black and white in that context. And if not, that would be very stunning and very sad, right? Because it has always happened that, 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 that racism has been, uh, has been able to intrude. So that plays into the idea that um, our thought that racism has always been with us and will always be with us in all times and in all places is probably an erroneous idea. That it has no basis in historical fact, even though it um, is counterintuitive when we look around our world. It would look like it's always, that it's embedded in the very planet, and I'm not, I'm not sure that that's, uh, that that's so.
Could you explain post-genocidal frame a little bit more? Saying that we are all oh, in the post-genocidal frame. Um, what's yeah, what I, 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 I was just meaning uh, post, post Nuremberg, post World War, post World War Two, and now uh, with the collapse of the Berlin Wall and uh, the Soviet Union, we're even somewhere else in that in that space. So I just simply meant, yeah, in relationship to that that period. So you take the end of the Second World War as a, as a significant point of demarcation. I mean, we, you've been talking about civil rights, of course, but you take that as a, as a real point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Uh, and one of the reasons why I do is that a number of important German intellectuals come over to the United States after uh, or during and after uh, the Second World War and members of the Frankfurt School. And so I've been trying to find any evidence uh, of a meeting between or some contact between Du Bois and Marcuse and I don't think there, I don't think there, there ever was one. Um, Marcuse was at Brandeis right before I got there as a graduate student. And he left Brandeis and went to the University of California, San Diego. And one of his students who had been at Brandeis but followed him to California was Angela Davis, right? And so, you know, I've wondered, I wonder if there's some record that, uh, that they ever that they were ever in contact because their ideas resemble each other. So that for me, the Frankfurt movement as, as an intellectual, uh, as a set of intellectual energies or protocols looks kind of like uh, certain moments of theories about uh, black culture and black culture work. And so that's, that, that, that's why I think that, that, that one of the reasons why I think the uh, post-World War II period is so, is so important. Yeah, it marks a, a watershed moment. That gentleman. Uh, I have two related questions. Uh -huh. I was wondering if you could go into more detail about what you thought uh, is different about new museums. What I thought? Is different about new museums. Oh, and yes. also, you mentioned how black culture has become a curricular object. Uh -huh. Do you think that makes the academy uh, a commemorative space? And sort of why or why not? Mm. You know, I don't think so because I think commemorative spaces or commemorative gestures have about them some element of uh, nostalgia, right? And that's why I am, um, I'm not opposed to commemorative gestures, but um, I kind of, a dear friend of mine, um, with whom I was arrested at a sit-in in, in Memphis as an undergraduate because we were trying to integrate the cafeterias around the University of Memphis that did not admit black people. And so uh, a friend of mine who um, was a student at a university on the other side of town, a young white man who's no longer so so young or <laughs> white man joined uh, that movement. So we were all we were all arrested that day. Now, this person is always going to civil rights memorials, King memorials, and I say to him, "Listen, God damn it, <laughs> it's not over yet. We're still doing civil rights." So that if you do the commemoration, it's like I have become a statue now. You know, I'm statutory or statuesque. 
And to me, that's a, that's a kind of death. It's a stop sign. And I'm not interested in a stop sign. So to me, the commemorative is the permission to stop and to say, I'm finished. I've reached the mountaintop. I am now as refined as I will ever be. I'm not going to have any more ideas about that. So to me, that's, that's, that's dangerous. Right. And it is a way, I think, of containment. That official spaces that give up places to the commemorative, right? Martin Luther King was killed in my hometown, in Memphis, Tennessee. But the city has a civil rights museum in it and has made holy ground the Lorraine Motel where Martin Luther King was shot where, where's, where his blood ran. That's now a sacred space. And so what I'm saying is that King's words are still transforming. It's not, the King movement is not, is not complete. So that when people remember that King said, I have a dream, that's not, that's not enough. It's a commemorative gesture that you can say, okay, I've had my vitamins for today and I can go on and do something else, right? And so that's why I, that's why I will not succumb to the commemorative gesture and that's why I'm critical of the commemorative gesture because that is one way that power can buy out a critique or a radical view. Give them their month of history. Give them their commemorative spaces. And then you can do whatever you want. Because some people think that the symbolic value or resonance of events like that is really what it's all about. And it isn't. It is about the transformation of social relations, right? And a more humane use of of, 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 of political power. So that the new museum, uh, to my mind, is uh, a museum that is uh, informal, uh, unofficial. I mean, for instance, at uh, Rivington Place in London, I saw uh, an exhibit called Without Sanctuary a couple of years ago and without sanctuary is about lynching, then that's really not a museum topic in our traditional sense of what a museum does, right? So the new museum is an attempt to expand our definition of what can be commemorated or exhibited so that it's both a great idea at the same time that it runs into this notion of the commemorative that uh, turns living things into dead things. Can I just follow Jake's question up? I think yeah. he had a, a second part to the question, right? So we'll have to come back to that. Okay. But so what, what do you do, you know, as I was listening to you and I find myself nodding and I go, yes, that's how it is. And well, we had just three weeks ago a writer here who actually fought very hard to have a commemorative plaque in Vancouver to actually at least remind people of, you know, what is called Hogan's Alley, which was, you know, this, this little lane, really, that was uh, destroyed by, by urban renewal. And even he was perplexed because before he came here, they had just gotten the plaque. And he came here and he said, and, and now I don't know what. <laughs> and it was actually an interesting moment. Someone who had fought for this for something like 15 years. Okay. And so I'm wondering, well, okay, so what then do we do? You know, do we, do we, do we actually say, take the plaque down? No. Okay. <laughs> so there's no. No, we don't, um, we don't say, we don't, we don't say take it down. Yeah. Um, we leave it there. And we actually, we actually visit it. But it doesn't mean that we stop petitioning that government or, tho or those people in those spaces, right? Yeah. But yeah, I, 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 see, what, I see what you mean. Um, I think his question was, mm -hmm. how do you now translate 
yeah. a sign of recognition, right? And recognition can be so dangerous, as you point out. Mm -hmm. How do you translate that into something that, that creates more action or that creates more culture? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my experience is that um, usually people stop with the plaque. Mm. Yeah. You know? So yeah. That we've, we've, we've accomplished something. We've really, we've, we've done something. The symbolic value of the plaque for some people seems to be enough, right? And I think that's the danger of, uh, of the plaque in the first place. Yeah. 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 It's a lid. Huh? It's a lid. It's a lid, exactly. Yeah, it's a containment. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Were we done with your question, Jake? Yeah. Okay. Um, I was wondering what what you mean exactly by critical culture. Do you mean by like work done by cultural intellectuals, or does it include expressive culture, like musical culture, for example? What, what exactly are you talking about? By critical culture, I, I mean, yes, the work of intellectuals, but I mean uh, the work of the intellect that can be done by people in and out of the academy, right? It is, it is, it is a way of living and being in the world that is thoughtful and meditative and um, is always looking gift horses in the mouth. You giving me that? Oh, well, now let me see about that. <laughs> let me walk around that. <laughs> Look up the backside of that. <laughs> see what's in there. And see if you really love me as much as you say that. Yeah, a critical disposition uh, toward, uh, toward the world. And I think that leads to, uh, well, a number of things that, that might include uh, a non-hierarchical sense or uh, a wider democratic sense. Or Yeah, he was disappointed that uh, black people had become materialists, like the culture around them, and that, 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 they were not, that they were not critical of the American creed and the gospel of wealth, that, and that they were as corrupt in that sense as, as anybody else in the society. And I think, that, I think that disappointed him. I think by the 50s, he understood that uh, for all his years as an activist, intellectual scholar, certain things that he had hoped would come true maybe weren't going to come true. And I think that's why he left the society and said to hell with the passport. He's buried in Accra, West, uh, West Africa. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I keep hearing bell hooks uh, while, you're, while you're talking, and especially the stuff about critical culture and about the Americanization of, of black culture. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if her, the idea that she has of her, the place of uh, the margins as a place of resistance, because uh, you can look into the dominant culture, because the dominant culture is so prevalent that everybody knows it, but you also have your own uh, perspective from the margins that you really have the best of both worlds. Yes. And I'm wondering if that is kind, it, it is sort of what you're, you're talking about with the idea of critical culture and then critical black culture uh, being a place that is used to uh, being in the margins and, and critiquing sort of the dominant mm -hmm. culture and the, the Americanization of, of, of black culture. Yes, yes, that's right. Um, and I would also want to probably cast an eye from time to time on marginality itself, right? Um, I mean, I wouldn't want to freeze the value of that either, or to turn that into uh, a, sacred, a sacred space, 
right? Um, because I, and there's also a way in which you can also reify the margin, right? If the margin remains a point of praxis or a point from which to perceive, that's one thing. But then to reify it as some kind of, of holy place, a holy site, I think is probably problematic, right? And I think that happened with certain black nationalist 60s formulas, really, right? I mean, they reified the marginal, the marginal spaces, right? Yeah. Can I, oh, can I just smuggle oh, mm -hmm. one more in? Because I just, as you were speaking about that, you know, I was looking at this passage that, that fascinated me. I think this comes from towards the end of that essay, right? The idea of black culture. And you, you say something like, because it was set aside, black culture could, by virtue of the very act of discrimination, become culture. Mm -hmm. And so, and then you say, in so far as historically speaking, it was for it was forced to turn its resources of spirit toward negation and critique. Mm -hmm. And so, how does that how how does that now speak to to what we just said? Well, I think that lines up. Yeah, because I think the space of negation and uh, critique would be the 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 marginal place. It's it's either actually marginal or symbolically marginal. Because in a, in, in, in a sense, those people who are located in privileged places can operate from a marginal perspective, right? And that's what I mean when I say critical culture can encompass anybody who wants to, who wants to take up the task. But for, for instance, um, a privileged uh, person to become critical of his class, is the kind of uh, is the kind of gesture that we always wait for and expect uh, to happen from a figure like uh, studies. Or Franklin studies. Roosevelt. Studies. And so just to, to stretch that out to like one more step, like I remember we had these conversations when Paul Gilroy's Against Race was coming out. And well, I have had some differences with you. Know, yes. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, I, I was wondering, like, in your definition of black culture, what role does race play in it? Because you know, you think it's automatic, right? We're yes. talking about black culture, and so that there's got to be race in it. But the longer I listen to what you're actually doing with that notion as a knowledge concept, race seems to have a, a, a very different function in that than when we just say black culture, yes, we know it's about race. Like, what is race doing for you? Okay, now? well, I think, yeah, the other, the other problem is, is the time progression or the temporal progression, that in, in some ways black culture depends on where you're talking about and when you're talking about. I think that Black culture in relationship to race really belongs to uh, a certain a certain time period, right? That it's an aspect of heritage coming out of the 18th and 19th centuries, right? And at a certain point, um, it's less racially determined. Or racially bound, but yeah, I think it's I think it's in there. But I think it's I think it's in there from the point of view of of when of when you're speaking, because one thing, one of the things that uh, racism does to take an entire group of people and place them in an inferior space to millions of other people, whoever those people are, without any regard for uh, individual talent, class, training. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't make any difference, right? If you are um, a black person in the United States at a particular moment, you could be W.E.B. Du Bois, but you were still subject to 
the race, race code or apartheid, right? Okay, so it's, it's clear that when you're talking about black culture under those circumstances, you have to take the racial code into, into consideration. When that collapses, then it seems to me yeah, that's when the term has to, be, has to be redefined, right? And that's what I meant a moment ago when I talked about the emancipatory project has been advanced by notions of black culture. But then it is advanced in relationship to a people, a putative people, assumed to be all the same in relationship to some other putative people assumed to be all the same, right? So that when you give up that particular notion that when things turn out to change those notions, then I think, I think the definition has to shift with it, yeah? And that's what, that's what I'm trying to be responsive to. What black culture in a um, late 20th century, early 21st century context, right? Yeah. Um, a, a, a culture that has a sort of parallel history with black culture, and that's indigenous culture. Mm -hmm. um, but. It, it seems like that culture hasn't experienced a lot of the, hasn't benefited from the emancipatory project in the, in the same way. So um, things like- Which one hasn't the- Pardon me? Which one hasn't benefited? Uh, indigenous the indigenous culture, yeah. the American Indian culture. Yep. Um, so that you don't, for example, when you were talking about um, commemoration, I've heard, um, I can't remember which scholar talked about this, but the need, there needs to be an acknowledgement of genocide, for example, that we have, we have monuments for the, um, uh, uh, for the Holocaust, but we don't have monuments to the genocide that happened in um, the Americas. Yeah. Um, and so I'm just wondering, in terms of you're situating black culture in a larger emancipatory project, and I'm just wondering if you've thought about how indigenous culture might, um, uh, or, you, or if there's dialogue, or if there needs to be dialogue mm -hmm. there, because yeah. it seems like there's a lot of taboos and silences around indigenous culture that there, that there aren't around black culture. There's something more dangerous about going there, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. For those who are in power, there's mm -hmm. so even the, the about becoming an academic object. I would argue, at least in the Canadian context, that Indigenous culture is not an academic object. No, the, you know, and and so what does that say about it's not safe territory to open up? That's right. Yeah, and I have often wondered why it isn't and why it is of um, all the cultures that, 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 that we refer to uh, in, in this way, why is that one so different? And um, you know, I'm just not, uh, I'm not, I'm not sure, but I have wondered if, if the difference was the massive resistance of Indian peoples over the 19th century. Um, they were, many of those uh, communities were um, a real threat to colonial order. Now, I'm not saying that there were not uh, African ins slave insurrections. But it seems to me that from that point of view, in terms of who is a more palatable civic object, that, that, that the black person is really forced into a meeker space in that sense, or a more palatable space than the native person. Now, that's just my own sense of, of, of what happened. Uh, some people believe 
And this is just at the, at the level of folklore. I don't know what, what the history would, would teach, and I need to read more of, that, uh, more of that history. But some people believe that A, slave-owning interest would not have hesitated to enslave the European if that had, if that had been possible to do. That, it, 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 that it's never been about color. That color is a rationalization. Color facilitates the work of, of, of getting your way as, a, as an owner and as a slaveholder. Now this is an argument that Eric Williams makes in his study of slavery. That the slave, that Europeans would not have, wouldn't have minded enslaving of the Europeans. They, 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 the African was a better worker under certain conditions. And then the, 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 the folk belief that accompanies that is that the Indian was not amenable at all to being held and captured and subdued because he was going to fight back. And not just fight back, that he would murder a whole lot of folk under certain conditions. Now that's, that's one view. So does that mean then that the punishment has lasted all this time uh, because the Indian fought back? Some people have that thesis about, uh, about Haiti, that it's being punished because it was the first black republic anywhere in the world. And that it um, defeated an important European power in the world at that time. And so you not only have to subdue those people, you have to keep, you have to continue humiliating them. So that's sort of, that's sort of the view about, uh, about the native person. And I wonder if that's, if that's true. That not only did, did, did native people have to be subdued, you had to keep humiliating them because they were so intractable as, as a force in national development. So I wonder, I wonder about that because I don't think there's ever been any real breakthrough in relationship to the question that, uh, that you're talking about, right? I mean, the Native people, in, it seems to me, are... Um, almost absolutely isolated from the rest of, uh, the rest of society, at least in, in, in my experience, that's so. You know, I was thinking, um, in doing a piece on race, I just wrote a, a piece for a dictionary and you should, you should be on the lookout for it. It's a dictionary of critical terms, um, gender related, that the University of Chicago Press is going to publish. And I did the entry on race for this gender related critical dictionary. And in doing the entry on race, I ran across um, at least 10, 12 books published, uh, and there, there are probably a lot more, but just in my little library, 10 to 12, maybe 15 books on, on race, so that you could really teach a course that would allow you to do the history of thinking about race in, in the Western context, in the context of uh, North American studies. And it's, 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 a lot, it's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, do you know about a book um, published in 2010 or 2011 by, uh, she's now Professor Emeritus, Nell Painter? called uh, The History of White People? Yeah, 
Have you seen that? Well, I've heard about it. You've heard about it? Yeah. That's one of them. So you could really, you could really do a good little course on conceptualizations of race, the history of race, or race as a historiography or a historiographical object. You could, you could really, you could do that. Yeah. I think we will have to stop. I would like to thank Professor Spillers for her 